What's up, everybody? This is Nate Marquardt, and this is Fighting for Truth. Welcome to the show. We are here again today with my buddy Dusty Devers, and we are going to talk about the issue of abortion. Now, last episode, if you haven't seen it, you really need to check that video out, that uh, podcast, because we go over the issue of abortion from a biblical standpoint, and we explain all the objections and all the answers to those objections. Uh, so it's going to be really helpful for you to watch that or listen to that episode before you jump into this show. Uh, but today, my friend Dusty Devers is on. He is the pastor at, uh, what is it, Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Elgin, Oklahoma. He is a uh, father of six children, married for 20 years. He is the executive producer of A Storm Comes Rolling Down the Plain. Uh, the VP of RescueThose.com, author of Loving Your IVF Neighbor, and he also released a hit country song called Gooder Than Transing Kids. Welcome to the show, Dusty. Thanks for having me, Nate. Always good to be with you, man. Yeah, man. Thanks, thanks a lot for coming back. Uh, we had a little production issue, and we lost our, our episode that we already recorded, so this is a re-recording last time you were in studio this time i couldn't get you here but uh, i'm really glad that we're able to do it again because i believe this is a, a really important show yeah last episode we were talking about the issue of a, abortion from a general standpoint and today we are going to be talking more on the issue of abortion when it comes to uh, the pro-life movement versus the abolitionist uh, movement so uh, first question, actually, I wanted to talk about your hit country song, because this kind of has to do with the issue. Uh, you had some interactions with a, a guy named Phil Vischer. If you don't know, Phil Vischer is the creator of Veggie Tales. Uh, my kids have watched his shows, and uh, they've actually watched him exegete the Bible, which is kind of scary at this point, because uh, if you hear some of the stuff he's talking about now. But anyway, uh, can you tell us about that interaction with Phil? Well, you know, Phil came at me. I guess he, he, he didn't come at me as much as he tried to troll me uh, because I wrote, I was one of the editors of a statement uh, called The Statement on Christian Nationalism. And he was, he on his podcast was going over that statement and had read my name and, and he's interacted with me a little bit in the past on abortion. Uh, so I think that some of that past carried over into when he tried to troll my name and he said, you know, with a name like Dusty Devers, you shouldn't be writing uh, statements on Christian nationalism. You should be writing statement or writing country music or playing baseball in the 1920s. And, uh, you know, the jokes on Phil, because I do write music. Mm -hmm. uh, I lead worship in our church and I played baseball in college. So, you know, OK, why not both? You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe it was a little prophetic. He said that. So <laughs> but uh, so, you know, the you said you had an interaction before with him on the issue of abortion. Uh, he takes, so, so again, we're talking about pro-life movement or pro-life stance versus the, what we would say is the biblical stance of abolition or, or abolitionist. And we want abortion to be abolished and we want equal protection for the victims. And, uh, and Phil Vischer has what would be called a pro-life position. Um, let me read a quote, a recent quote. I'm going to put any quotes. Uh, I'll put the links in the descriptions so you can check back on those. He's, Phil Vischer said, he said, I was in favor of making exceptions for the life of the mother and probably f for rape if it was very early in the pregnancy. And he says... I believe this is the position of the National Association of Evangelicals. So when, uh, when, when he was asked why he referred to the National, uh, the National Association of Evangelicals rather than Scripture for his uh, basis, for his thoughts, he, this is his response. He says, I didn't refer to Scripture because there is no specific Scripture that tells us 
whether it's better to force a 10-year-old girl to become a mother after she's been violently raped as opposed to taking a plan B pill that might cause a fertilized egg to fail to implant. And he, then he says, which most of these folks consider to be an abortion. Uh, he also said this, it's a, it's a situation where we are compounding evil with another evil. Either the evil of a violent rape and then a very early stage abortion or the evil of a violent rape and then forcing a 10-year-old girl uh, to become a mother at 10. At 10. If, uh, he says, if you've seen a verse about that, I haven't. Love your neighbor could lead you in either direction. Now, uh, of course, we talked last episode about the, you know, he obviously is saying one evil with another evil. He's comparing the two evils, saying that it's evil to force a, a girl to become a mother at 10. Now, uh, what would, I mean, yeah, Dusty, what do you have to say? I mean, he has a lot of errors in his thinking. What do you have to say about all that? Yeah, Phil Vischer is exposing himself as not having a biblical view of life and and uh, loving your neighbor. It's very uh, worldly in in practice. Uh, really, it's it's uh, you know it's Darwinian in a sort. Uh, whenever you just are able to subjectively define based on Phil's feelings uh, what he thinks, or maybe his his received position from the culture when life begins and who has value. I mean, we've done that historically. Societies have done that, and it's ended up uh, with the murder of millions of people. <clears throat> you know, you think of Mao Zedong and Pol Pot and uh, Hitler, and y- you think of America uh, since, since Roe v. Wade in 1973, killing over 65 million freeborn children. Well, why? Because the same, it's the same idea. The uh, the answer to the Jewish problem for Hitler was to define them as not having worth and value because some some category or incidental characteristic of their life, and that's the same thing that we've done with the preborn problem. We've decided that we can murder preborn children because, well, some incidental characteristic about their life didn't match up with our subjective view of personhood. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the error that Phil Vischer has fallen into. Fallen into, uh, he has chosen worldly wisdom over God's word. That's right, and 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 when he chooses worldly wisdom, he's uh, <clears throat> his points are not logical because only God's wisdom is completely 100% consistent when you have a, a, a biblical worldview. So you see what he, he, he says, uh, he, you're, you're choosing between two evils. And so he's conflating being raped in both of them as the evil, but then he's saying you're forcing her to have an abortion. You know, you're either having an abortion, which is evil, or you're forcing her to become a mom. Well, you know, uh, first of all, who is forcing her to become a mom? It was the rapist. That's evil right. to force her in that way. But now that she's there, what do we do as Christians? We don't do something evil to make up for something evil. Two two wrongs don't make a right. And uh, right. so, yeah, it's like, um, <clears throat> like you said, well, it's, it's <throat> the wisdom of the world. Yeah. Uh, n- number one, Romans 3, 8 says... Sh- Paul is is talking to some people who are willing to do evil uh, so that some other good would come about. And he said, should be should we be uh, do evil that some good may come? And he says he doesn't even have to answer it because he because he knows it's just condemnable on mm-hmm. its face. And he says that basically their condemnation is just. They're condemned for thinking that we can violate one of God's laws like, not murdering a child or giving love to your preborn neighbor for the sake of loving some other person. Love doesn't violate itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what that would it, it's, that's a condemnable position that he holds. Um, mm-hmm. second, Phil is not he he's like I said, 
he's showing that his views are not biblical. Who owned, who opens and closes the womb? God does. Now, did a vile and wicked thing happen to that young girl? Well, absolutely. And that rapist needs to be punished to death. But our laws aren't sustaining that right now either. It wouldn't protect her, nor would it protect the life in her womb. So the rapist needs to be punished to death. Number two, she needs to be protected by that law. And she needs to recognize, and all people need to recognize, that no uh, fertilization happens unless God plans for it. God is the author of life. He opens and closes the womb. And if he, when he does, he always calls the child a blessing. That girl, though she has been raped and a wicked, awful thing has happened to her, God has blessed her with something that's good. Now, if she's that young, I mean, that we're talking about such an extreme rarity. We should back it up a few years uh, to be a little more appropriate, and even that is very rare. But still, the doctors will be watchful and waiting. They will give her the kind of care that she needs. But what she has ultimately received in the midst of this awful, wicked thing is God giving her a life that can really show God's purpose and redemption in her life, that there is hope after something vile and wicked has happened to, to you, that you've been a victim, but God is faithful and he's capable of caring for you in a very particular way. So uh, why would we why would we punish a child, that preborn child in that mother's womb, to death for the crimes of the father? It, it's, yeah. it's just it's unjust. on its face, all kinds of problems. Did you did you see the Babylon B article that they did on Phil Vischer after that those statements? Uh, uh, <laughs> it's, I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's I mean, Babylon B is pretty funny. Um, they said uh, apparently abortion is a nuanced issue. It's 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 just really funny that uh, Laura, the carrot has an abortion, and ju they're just talking about how abortion is a nuanced issue and. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, like it's not black and white. Well, that's what Phil did. He tried to nuance everything. And, and the, the problem is, whenever you have worldly wisdom and you nuance with worldly wisdom, you're going to get further and further af af afar from the biblical text. And you're going to make those concessions in your own mind. And you're going to usurp God's sovereignty. You're going to violate the authority of God's word. And you're going to continue to you can be a nuance, bro, if you want, but you're going to be against God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's jump into basically what the difference between pro-life and abolitionist movement. I mean, we kind of highlighted, uh, Phil highlighted for us, the he said uh, that he would make exceptions in the case of rape and incest and uh, health of the mother or life of the mother. And so let's, wh why don't you give us a rundown of uh, the difference between the two methods, between their ideology, their basis for everything, what they're doing, and their, their practice, like what are their methods? Yeah, so it's probably best to just take the pro-life industry for their own word, or their, the pro-life movement in their own words. <clears throat> they released a letter on May 12th, 2022. So last year, a little over a year ago, they released a letter and it, there were over 77 pro-life organizations. They released it at the exact moment that an abolition bill in Louisiana was being argued on the House floor. And that letter functionally killed because of their influence, the 70 plus organizations functionally killed that abolition bill. And that was their intention. And that that letter has come back uh, in several other states where there are abolition bills to uh, rear its head. And here's what the letter in essence said. We state unequivocally that we do not support any measure seeking to criminalize or punish women. And we stand firmly opposed to including such penalties in legislation. Okay. So 
I'm going to read another sentence, but first note that the pro-life movement, we call them big pro-life, does not support criminalization of the act of abortion. No abolitionist is seeking to uh, criminalize women. That's uh, that's a straw man that the pro-life movement has has raised. They've erected. They don't want to kill. We, they don't want to criminalize the women who ch who kill their children. Is what they're saying. Yeah. Well. Yeah. They they try to. They just leave to, that clause out. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they don't want to criminalize who, women. Dot dot dot. Who kill their children? Yeah. Who kill their children with malice aforethought? Who have their children ripped apart, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, shredded in their wombs or eaten uh, by by abortion pills. So that's the first thing to note. Historically, and these uh, seventy plus organizations said we are America's leading voices for the pro life movement. So mm -hmm. they are. So take the pro life movement for their word. They will. They do not and will not ever and have never historically, have never supported any legislation that would criminalize the act of abortion and treat it as prenatal homicide, okay? That's number one. If you, if you want to understand the pro-life movement, you have to understand they do not want to criminalize it. They want to treat abortion as though it's health care, not prenatal homicide to be criminalized, okay? And that's number one. The second thing, the second determining key about the pro-life movement is they say this, women are victims of abortion and require our compassion and support. Turning women who have abortions into criminals is not the way, okay? That's the second thing. It's called the second victim narrative or the second victim doctrine. They think that in an abortion, there's a victim called the preborn child who has been killed. So they'll acknowledge there is a murder, but the other victim, the, the one who was involved, the abortionist who was involved in that is the mother. The mother is a victim. Now, what's she a victim of? She's a victim of, of bad education. She's a, vic a victim of laws that tell her that it's okay for her to kill her child up to a certain age. She's a victim of family. She's a victim of any number of things. Now, is it true that some women are coerced uh, and have their life and limb threatened? Well, this is true. It happens. It is rare. There, women are pressured at different times. Now, their boyfriend might pressure them. Oh, you can't do this. Uh, 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 their mom and dad might pressure them. This is going to ruin your life and your goals for, for your education or where you want to take your life. You're too young to have a child. Uh, you know, Planned Parenthood might pressure them or some other abortion mill might pressure them. Oh, you really need this uh, for those various reasons because they want the money too and they want the baby parts or whatever else, you know. The, the, the only so, ones that would actually be forcing them are, are in cases of rape and incest and if there was no legal abortion, that wouldn't even be possible. So that's right. That's right. So what does that that woman who is being truly pressured and coerced need? She needs a law that criminalizes the act of abortion so that any accomplice will be put in prison. She can't even go out and the, the pimp or someone else couldn't go out and find a legal abortion. And so then, then people say, well, that would be, you, you just want unsafe abortions. Well, aren't all abortions unsafe? I mean, you're killing a child. You shouldn't, that shouldn't be legal. We shouldn't take, uh, you, you know, uh, homicide and make it legal just because it's unsafe for the victim. Yeah. Anyway, back to the, to the uh, pro-life movement. You've got those two things that essentially... Uh, define them, and that is that they will not criminalize the act of abortion, and they always treat women as victims of abortion. They can never be abortionists, the one who are involved in the malicious murder of a child that's planned. Yeah, and 
<clears throat> even okay, even if you take out the the piece of equal protection, a lot of pro life wants to make it illegal to have an abortion. But is is that actually true with the pro life movement? Do are they actually trying to make abortion illegal, or well, are, are they just trying to regulate it and 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 keep their industry running? Yeah. Let's talk about uh, two things that how they want to regulate or incrementally uh, see it come to an end. And then before that, though, I would like to talk about another example that kind of gets to your point. Um, so there's a House resolution right now that's been presented to the U.S. House of Representatives, and it's called House Resolution 464. And the title is Acknowledging that Unborn Children Are Legal and Constitutional Persons Who Are Entitled to the Equal Protection of the Laws. It was presented by Representative Doug Lamborn. Now, that on its face, the title sounds great. And there's a lot of people who would say, see, look, the pro-life movement wants equal protection. Well, they use that language, but it's kind of like Mormons using Christian language. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not on the same terms. They aren't on the same terms with us. And here's what the third resolved says of that House Resolution 464. It acknowledges our constitutional duty and solemn obligation to guarantee the equal protection of the laws to every unborn child within the jurisdictional and geographic reach of the Constitution. Hey, amen. Equal protection for every preborn child in the reach of the United States Constitution. But then, there's a comma, and it says this, which shall not, so equal protection shall not be construed to permit the prosecution of any woman for the death of her unborn child. So what that resolution does is exactly what the pro-life movement has done for years and years and exactly what they say they will do. They will not criminalize the act of abortion and they will only give blanket immunity to a woman who murders her child with malice of forethought. Therefore, that preborn child does not have equal protection. Yeah, and it makes it not illegal. <laughs> They're keeping abortion legal by saying that you can't punish the, the mom. Yes. That, that's crazy, yeah. And he, the reality is this will do nothing to impact the number of abortions in the United States. It might make it tick down a little bit for a little while, but in every state that has, you know, banned abortion, they'll say, we banned abortion. Well, there's no state that's banned abortion because in every state, a mother is a protected class of murderer who can kill her child with malice of forethought by taking abortion pills or going and getting one herself in another state or even in that mm. own her own state. So what the what the the industry has done, the pro-life movement has done this. They have moved abortion from mills in some of these states to mothers' living rooms. And they've turned mm -hmm. the abortionist from being doctors to being mothers. The uh, the abortionist now in all these states, and 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 it's all across the United States, but so if a bill like the, a constitutional amendment even happened, and it said that last line, which shall not be construed to permit the prosecution of any woman for the death of her unborn child. What that law would do is codify the legal right for mothers to murder their preborn child by pill. It would move all abortionists to being mothers. Mm -hmm. That's that's the logic of the pro-life movement. Now, it's not biblical. It doesn't offer protection it, for preborn children. It doesn't treat those preborn children as though they are like you and me and deserving of equal protection. So what we will not punish, we will not protect. If we will not punish the act of murder, we will not protect the victims of murder. That's contra what God's word says in Romans 13. Romans 13 tells you exactly what just law and lawmakers would do. And it says that, 
these authorities are instituted by God, so they're servants of God, and what must they do? They must be, verse 3, terrors to evildoers, not to good doers, but to evildoers. You're supposed to fear authority if you're an evildoer. Now, how would you fear authority? You write laws that would punish evil, and it would protect the good. That's what must be done. These uh, servants of God who are just authorities, who practice righteousness, would bear the sword. And that means it's a use of force by government against those who would want to take the life of another and another innocent person. And they bear the sword, they must not do it in vain, and they must avenge the innocent. But the pro-life movement doesn't do that. And I think you hit it on the head, which is basically you're, you're saying their position is unbiblical. Um, you know, I, I think most or a lot of Christians, I should say, I, I don't know if most, but a lot of Christians... Uh, identify as pro-life because they believe it's the biblical position. They believe it's the Christian position. I know that I did. Before I knew any of this, uh, these ideas uh, about the pro-life movement or even just the, the idea of uh, laws that would regulate abortion, I mean, that's, that's not a Christian law because you don't regulate uh, rape. You don't, you don't regulate any other murder, why would you regulate this kind of murder? Uh, but so what would you say to a Christian uh, that is currently or has in the past identified themselves as pro-life? What, what would you like to tell them? What, I mean, what, should they, what should they do? Well, I would encourage them to, if they have a biblical view of the beginning of life and what it is to protect life, or really to love your neighbor as yourself, than to consider the tenets of the abolition of abortion movement. The abolitionism didn't start with uh, abortion. This is uh, every evil, or every age has its evil, and every age has its abolitionist, is how uh, one abolitionist put it back in the abolition of slavery. So this is true. There are great evils in every age, and there are those who must rise up and say, we must cease doing evil. We must practice doing justice, as Micah 6, 8 says. Uh, Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. And this is what it is to be an abortion abolitionist. Let me just give you examples of, of uh, the five tenets. The five tenets are have an acrostic, and it's called GATES, G-A-T-E-S. It's gospel-driven. So the abortion abolition movement is driven by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are uh, Christians at root who are taking God's word into a world with great evil and saying, what does God's word demand of us? God's word is the standard. And then A, aligned providentially, we simply obey God and trust him for the results. We don't practice cunning or tampering with God's word, as 2 Corinthians 4 says. We obey what God says, no matter if that's a, a state that can handle it or not. If the people are hardened or if they're soft, we just merely obey what God says and trust him for results. So gospel-driven, aligned providentially, and T is through the church. This is God has commanded the saints to go and obey the Great Commission and fulfill it, to make disciples and teach them to obey everything he's commanded. It's through the church that God will eradicate the great evil of abortion. E is engaged biblically. It's God's word that is the standard for all life and godliness. Apart from God's word, we have no dawn, Isaiah 8 says. It is sufficient. It is living and active and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Why would we trust some other word? And then the S is sought 
immediately without compromise. And by sought immediately, we're again coming back to saying, we don't care if the world or if your state or a particular area can't handle it. We are concerned about what God says, and we say what God says about this issue. So get, let me give you an example. Uh, I think we've used this before, but if if I'm counseling a man who's who's involved in looking at pornography and he says, Pastor, I, it's you know, I looked at pornography seven times last week and can you help me? And I say, you know, I can really help you. Let's seek to get rid of your pornography addiction by just addressing what's on the outside and doing it incrementally by an unjust way. And here's what I mean. This week, you're going to, let's do six times that you look at pornography. And then next week, we'll work on five. And over the next six weeks or seven weeks, we'll be down to zero. And then maybe we can deal with your lust problem. If I took that approach as a pastor I would hope that most people, if they heard about it, wouldn't want to come to my church because they would know that I am a wicked operator, that that man's family, that man's wife, that man's uh, direction and his future are not being founded upon God's word, but upon some pragmatic view that's going to cause him and others harm. And that's exactly what the pro-life movement has been doing. Very good. I think that <clears throat> you mentioned the A, aligned providentially, uh, and then uh, I believe E was engaged biblically. Um, I, I think that's very important uh, because the, one, of their, one of their methods or, or their approaches to ending abortion is, like you said, incrementalism, uh, but also pragmatism. Uh, when you know, I, I had the privilege, privilege to have lunch with a house rep in Texas recently, and he's a, he's a godly man, you know, he's a Christian, uh, but unfortunately he's bought into some of these, what, what I would say is worldly wisdom, you know, that's not going to work when, I, when I, we talk about abolishing it, making it, you know, a criminal act. Uh, it's like, well, the people aren't ready for that, that's that's, uh, you know, he gave me all the pragmatic reasons why doing the right thing, writing the, the, the laws in a godly way wouldn't work. And uh, so, yeah, what do you have to say about that approach? Yeah, I think you, you nailed it on the head. There is, there is a, a way to look at lawmaking that can be, now look, not all incremental laws are wrong. What we're talking about is unrighteous increments, being willing to do some evil that some good may come, being willing to say, well, we'll start with a 15-week ban. You can't kill children before uh, or after 15 weeks, but you can kill them before so that then we can work down and maybe we'll get rid of uh, dilation and curatage where you cut them up and then you suck them out with a vacuum, or maybe we'll cut off certain branches of the tree. And then eventually, maybe the tree will just wither up and die because we're mm. not going to cut the root by criminalization. But the incrementalism is taking, and it's a willingness to do unrighteous increments, increments or moves or steps that violate God's word so that they can get to what they see as their goal. Now, their goal, again, like we said, is, is not criminalization of the act of abortion. But here's the problem with incrementalism. Incrementalism contends with the conscience instead of cooperates with it. Uh, that's I'm just going to list a few. Incrementalism, un, where you promote unrighteous increments, is willing to violate God's word on what he says in order to get something good. So it's doing being willing to do some evil that some good may come. That's first. The second was it, it contends with the conscience that God wrote his law in our heart. And then the conscience is functions alongside the law to, to approve you or accuse you. But these unrighteous increments contend with the conscience 
instead of cooperating with it. And that's Mm -hmm. wicked. You're actually contending against God instead of cooperating with him. They also, uh, unrighteous increments, also corrupt culture rather than correct culture. Uh, They flood culture with like the doctrines of men and they enshrine cultural decay and enslavement and not thriving under God's word and the liberty of the conscience that's functioning by approved, being approved before God. It's really nasty. So there's, let me give you a couple more because I think this is important to understand. Unrighteous increments encourage guilt and condemnation before God rather than direct people to Christ for forgiveness. Well, how is that? Well, good tactics uh, for manipulators and cult leaders are to use guilt and condemnation. This is not a good tactic for Christians. So in essence, what these unrighteous increments are, are manipulator uh, tactics for, I mean, I don't want to call them all cult leaders, but it's it's in the camp. When a culture is flooded, in this, in this, this is a way to think about it. When a culture is flooded by guilt and condemnation by laws that do not point to the character of God, then what happens? That culture, because of guilt and condemnation being flooded over it, it becomes hopeless, depressed, and despairing. And then it gets desperate for a way out and it invents solutions that are ultimately destructive for that culture. That's what the pro-life movement has been training a culture for years and years. It's a, they're manipulative tactics. They're not in alignment with what God's word says about forgiveness. And I'll just give you one more example of what these uh, unrighteous increments do. They inscribe the commandments of men that enslave rather than declare the holy law of God that points to freedom in Christ. Mm, Why would we ever turn to the uh, pro-life movement to do these kinds of things through their unrighteous increments? They're not providing, providing freedom in Christ and promoting the hope of the gospel. They're enslaving, manipulating, and corrupting culture and consciences. Very good. It's it's all connected. You, you, when you engage biblically, then uh, it's gospel centered because it drives people to Christ. Yeah, that's right. Um, so what what about more on the pragmatism side? What you know? Okay, so for example, uh, there w- there was one law where we were talking, and you know he he said. Well, if if that law or if that bill would have been put forward, you know, it, it would have gotten shot down, and we wouldn't be where we are now, like as if they'd made progress. And and so he, he uh, basically, you know, w- what if? Let's see, what if that is actually true? What if we're too extreme and we say no, this has to stop immediately, and it should be punishable by law, the same as if you killed your five-year-old child? Uh, and what if? that's too extreme for the people and they say, no, we don't want that law. What, what if yeah. that's true? If that's true, you've got a culture again, that has been so hardened and calloused against God. And you want to listen to them to make your laws rather than listen to God. So if you're willing to go with that culture and let them establish the parameters for your lawmaking, then what, how far will it go? You functionally have become an atheist, a fool who denies God, and your mind isn't being instructed by the counsel of God's word, but it's in being instructed by a corrupted culture. And so what you then are willing to do, because the culture would allow it, but they won't allow you to do what God says, what you're willing to do is... uh, compromise God's holy standard of justice, promote God-hating partiality, challenge God's lordship over the heart and the conscience, and ultimately reject God's command to repent of sin completely and immediately, you are putting God off to the side. You're usurping him and becoming a God for yourself, all because you're looking to culture and saying, what will they allow? Instead of, what does God demand? Mm, very good. 
I don't care if a culture, like, I'm going to restart on something here mm-hmm. because it's so sickening to me. I don't care if your state is like Virginia and your governor says, we're going to, we're going to let the baby be born and we're going to hold it alive for a little while and we'll keep it comfortable until the mom decides on whether she wants to keep it or not. I don't care if that's how hardened you are or if you're like California and you have just abortion on demand up till uh, the moment of birth. I don't care if that's what state you're living in, then either you need to be very, very clear and go on a campaign saying, this is what God demands and be a prophet that God commands you to be, or you need to leave. That state is being turned over to great godlessness or and and especially if if men if strong men won't stand up and preach what God says in those states, then I mean, there's multiple ways that a culture gets to that place. And we've already talked about how you know unjust, wicked laws train culture to get more and more hardened, and wicked and evil and desperate. Uh, but we have serious problems if we say, well a state will only allow this. And then we listen to that state and we let it have authority. I know, I know really well-meaning friends who are attorneys and they'll argue with me. Oh, but, but we can, let's try to get what we can. And I'm saying, is that what God tells you to do? You're so strong as a man on so many other issues, but you won't stand up and tell this legislator or tell your the state legislation that you want and demand what God says, and you're going to be a prophet, even if they stone you. Like, what are we doing? What are we doing if we give over, we cede to the culture authority that is only God's? There, the problem then is not as much the cultures, they do have a problem, but the problem is on us because we have given up the greatest weapon and the greatest um, means for establishing justice and practicing righteousness in a world when we say that God's word doesn't matter as much as what the culture says. I'm I'm worked mm. up over it. I'm sick of oh, it. Yeah. You know, I, I hate it. It's, it's the softening of the message, the softening of God's word, uh, people trying to make it palatable by, by, for, for unbelievers. And it's, it happens in the church. It's the, the, the softening of God's words happening in the church. And now this is what we have. We have leaders of our country that soften the message. They soften justice. So it's soft, right? So it's, it doesn't cut like the sword, like it's supposed to. And yeah, it's, it's evil. It's wicked. Um, and yeah, I think it, it, it does take courage and faith, I would say is the biggest thing it takes to stand up and preach the truth when you know it's not going to be accepted, when, when you know that people are going to reject it, that you're going to have trouble and, and you might fail, but that's, it's not, failure's not, <laughs> uh, success for us is preaching the truth in love. It's not, the the outcome is not up to us. That's right. Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right, Nate. Um, That's one of the reasons I think we get along so well is because we are are tied to God's word and we're willing to go back and forth over it uh, because God's word is is what it is. It's God's. It's not ours. And we must be convictional over it. And we have to be willing to risk our life and limb if it means uh, standing up on what God's word says, because ultimately, what can they do to us? They can harm our bodies. Maybe they throw us in a grave with us all being chopped up. They can't harm our souls. We can harm our souls by rejecting God and rejecting what God says. And we can uh, do damage to the message of Christ by being willing to put away the sword. Um, but that's that's a wicked, wicked thing to do in the sight of God. He does not deserve us putting away and us backing down from his word. He needs men like like you who will stand up on the truth of God's word into a culture that is spitting venom and fire at you and say, I don't care what you have to say. 
I see my Christ seated on his throne with Amen. all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And as he says, I will go. I do not care. Take life, limb, take it all. To have Christ is complete and total gain for me. I will get rid of everything that I once formerly had, like Paul says, so that I can know the power of Christ and know his resurrection, be found in him and not having a righteousness of my own that I manipulate, but having one that is righteous in Christ and having him for eternity. You you said that it's it's ultimately it's a it's a who you fear problem. You're supposed to fear him who has the the power over our soul, but instead they're they're fearing man over God, and right. and 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 really that's idolatry. So w when you when we talk about lawmakers and politicians who are compromising on what's right, on they're compromising, they're they're straying away from what God says. And they're they're compromising for the culture and softening God's word. They're actually fearing man over God, and that's evil. That's idolatry. Exactly. It's it's, it's uh it's like Saul, right? It's cowardice. Absolutely, it is cowardice. It's fearing the approval and loving the approval of man rather than the approval that comes from God. And it is a snare. It is a banquet in the grave. And you might get uh, all the best gourmet food in that grave, but ultimately it's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And when it becomes your lifeblood, it's going to suck you further and further in because you fear man, and you're going to get only what man can give you. You will not get what God can give you, and that is forgiveness in Christ, eternal life, a new heart, and keeping you in him for eternity, and then giving you life evermore with the saints. Treasures treasures in heaven, right? Versus right. treasures on earth. That's right. Okay, uh, I have some statistics here. I thought was real interesting. These are from PewResearch.org. Uh, it says 37% of Americans, and I believe this was from 2022, 37% of Americans believe that abortion should be illegal. And now uh, that is, so that's 37 say that it should be illegal. Only 8% of Americans believe abortions should be illegal in all cases with no exceptions. So uh, another statistic to go along with that is that 63% of Americans claim to be Christian or Catholic. Uh, so both of those worldviews should uh, include abortion being illegal. Uh, why do you think it is that there are 63% of Americans claim to be Christian or Catholic, and then only 8% of them think that abortion should be illegal in all cases. Because the, the, we're wicked at heart. Our natural proclivity is to justify our sin, and even the greatest of sin, which is murder. And we have any number of ways to justify ourselves. So you start with the fallenness, the depravity of man. That's the one. That's the first reason. And then you have to say, well, why would a society be willing to answer direct questions about abortion, about the murder of preborn children in a particular way? And you have to say, well, somebody has trained them. So what trains? Galatians tells us that laws are tutors. The laws train people what is good and what is evil, what's acceptable, what's punishable. And when our laws, since 1973, at least, and well before that, have said a mother is a protected class of murderer, that she doesn't deserve to be punished for killing her own child, and beyond that, that abortion is acceptable in various degrees in all of these various states, then you have trained a culture what is acceptable 
in the treatment of children from the moment of fertilization or beyond, what it is to have justice for them or not. And so when we talk about uh, justice being equal, we're saying it's not it's not true justice. We're not practicing righteousness. Justice is the practice of righteousness. Before whom? By what standard? Well, before the holy judge of the universe, the creator and maker. That's before God. So at that point, we have the depravity of man's soul. Then we have laws that are training them that it's okay to do wicked and murder preborn children. And then we have a church that has not consistently for the last 50 years said abortion is prenatal homicide and we must criminalize the act of abortion as murder. We haven't said that. So the church has, has been compromised on this point. We're mm -hmm. willing to say we want increments. We want it to go. We want it to be bad. But you cannot, from a generalization standpoint, at a categorical standpoint, say that the church has been abolitionist, who have demanded that abortion, the act of prenatal homicide, be criminalized. We have too many, like I said earlier, we have too many factors that are teaching the culture that it's okay to do these great and vile things. So you have 67% Christian and Catholic, and that bigger percentage hasn't for the last 50 years as a group. Well, and, and it used to be much greater. That's yeah. It's declined to that point. It used to be much greater. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, and we, I mean, we talked about it a little bit before, but how is abortion and... Uh, abolition, how is that related to the gospel of Jesus Christ? How is, uh, Amer I mean, sorry, Christians being involved in politics and fight, you know, actively fighting against abortion, how is that related to the gospel of Jesus Christ? You mentioned that it's a tutor. Is there anything else? Yes, there, there are a lot of things. Um, number one, abortion is the antithesis to the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ says he gave his life so that we could have life and life everlasting with him and not being uh, perished in the in the pits of hell under our just condemnation. Abortion says your life for mine. It's the opposite of the gospel. It demands that that child be sacrificed for the life that that woman wants. So that's the first thing. Second, how does the gospel, uh, in, uh, how does abortion impacted by the gospel? Well, the gospel is what God has done in Jesus Christ, namely through his sinless life, his uh, substitutionary death, his resurrection to justify us, his ascent to the throne, to the right hand of God, and his coming return, what God has done in Christ to reconcile sinners to himself, and what God also is doing to bring all things under the rule of Christ through the gospel and through the saints living holy lives. Now, when you look at the Great Commission, Jesus commanded for the church to go and make disciples and how they do that through the preaching of the gospel. And then they teach those people to obey everything that Jesus commanded and making laws that would, that would uh, treat abortion as murder that it is prenatal homicide is teaching the culture. It's teaching people to look at everything and obey everything that Christ commanded. That's just one of those. So when in uh, Psalm 110, it says that Jesus will make every enemy a footstool under his feet. And abortion, the murder of chil preborn children, is an enemy that Christ will put under his feet. Now, let me just give you one more example. There's plenty. Uh, Titus 2.11 says this, for the grace of God has appeared. That grace of God is talking about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, reconciling sinners to God through his 
life, death, and resurrection. Uh, the grace of God has appeared. And what does that grace of God do? It brings salvation for all people, and then it does something else. That grace appears, and then it trains people to renounce ungodliness and underhanded ways, the worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Abolishing abortion is not part of the content of the gospel, but it is an implication of the gospel. It is an outworking Amen, yeah. applying the gospel to your life. If you have the, the good news of Jesus Christ, if you're born again and you're in Christ, then that grace that has saved you also trains you to renounce ungodliness and underhanded worldly ways and to be zealous for good works. And one of those good works is to see abortion abolished. All right. And I think maybe a, a natural question that comes from that then you know, you have this idea, I think you were talking to Phil Vischer about it, about Christian nationalism. Is it, is it the church's job to Christianize America? And, you know, what, what, uh, what position should the Christian hold or, or um, what is our position or our um, method as far as the government? Like what, what should, is it okay for a Christian to be a politician or active politically or making laws, things like that? Uh, absolutely. Christians should be involved in every sphere of life. And in their involvement in that sphere, they are to take the good news of Jesus Christ and be ready in season and out of season to reprove, rebuke, exhort. And in that way, they will equip people for every good work to be men of God. In this, in this is this is what we mean. You you ask a question: uh, Should Christians want to Christianize an, a nation or their world? Well, what else would they do? You know, <laughs> do they want to turn them into pagans? Uh, do, should, do we want just, everyone to just go to hell? <laughs> that's right. Like, <laughs> what kind of wickedness are you um, willing to promote if you don't want to see them Christianized? You know, uh, it's either Christ or chaos. It's either uh, Christian theology or it's serpentine theocracy. Satan is going to push a dictatorship, and it's a serpentine theocracy that started in Genesis 3, where he told that woman, did God really say? He was questioning the authority of God and then willing to usurp God's role. Now, that's there's only two ways to look at this. We either have a world that's governed by God's word, what God really said, thus saith the Lord, or a world that's governed by the serpent, by the nakash is what he's called in Hebrew, the, the uh, adversary, the devil. And so do I want to see the world Christianized? Well, absolutely. Do I want to see them come to Christ first? Yes. Am I willing for them who have not come to Christ to be governed by Christian law? Well, absolutely. I love my neighbor. I don't hate them. I don't want them seeing, uh, being governed by uh, serpentine or demonic or some other version of morality as you know, as though there is a good one. Uh, I, I do want to see them come to Christ, and I do want to see them governed by God's word. That that's that's how a nation will thrive and mm. see the practice of justice because they're actually practicing in alignment with God's holy character. God created us to worship Him and enjoy Him forever, and you can't worship and enjoy God forever uh, unless you come to Christ and are reconciled to God through Christ canceling the record of sin that is against you and offering you forgiveness. But you, uh, a, a nation, even if those people, if there's a group of people that won't submit to the um, to Christ by faith, they're still better 
governed by the law of God, by the thus saith the Lord, rather than thus saith the serpent. Mm. Yeah, if, if when we have just laws, it's better for everyone. So in other words, when we have Christian laws, it's better. So of course, in that respect, we also want to Christianize America. I mean, it was founded on biblical principles anyway, so... Yeah, and there's a way to think categorically that says uh, when we talk about Christianize, we can think of it in two ways. One is actual Christians, a, a group of people who are Christians, and that only Christians, we should only call them Christian who are Christians, but then we can also think in a category of a nation's laws. And what's the moral framework for that nation's laws? Are they Christian, or are they the uh, are they the Christian God, and they're from His Word, or are they from some other system? And I'm saying, I want to see a nation that's Christianized and by having full of Christians, but I also want to see a nation. Uh, until that happens, until it's full of Christians, I want to see a nation that's Christianized in the sense that its laws reflect God's word. Yes, and I, I think it's important that we t say that that's not, that's not saying we're going to force people to go to the church. That's not what that means, right? Yeah. God God doesn't force anything like that. He doesn't force us to go to church. <laughs> it's no, just no. laws. <laughs> yeah, just laws. You you can't coerce. Uh, somebody's soul into being regenerated, to being born again. You can't coerce that. That's a work of God. That is a divine work. But you can write laws that either affirm what God says about a nation's thriving, or you can write laws that war against what God says and therefore war against your neighbor. So to love God and love neighbor as yourself is what will cause the thriving of any nation and any people, whether that's in the home or a church or a city or a state or a nation. Mm. Now, uh, what would you say, is there, is there a requirement, a biblical requirement or an ethical requirement for any Christian or every Christian in America to do something? What, like what do... Uh, what do you? What would you say their requirement is as far as abortion? Yeah. Well, your requirement is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then God gives other specifics throughout the scriptures as to what it is to be zealous for good works. When we say, well, what, what good works are we to be zealous for? Well, that's the third use of the law, the law of God, which is summarily comprehended or it's summed up in the Ten Commandments. The second table tells you what it is to love your neighbor as yourself. You honor your mother and your father. You don't murder, and you do everything you can to preserve life. That's the sixth commandment. Do everything you can to preserve your own life and the life of your neighbor. That's what it means to not murder. You're not only just not killing, but you're preserving their life. And how would you do that? Well, as a Christian, we know that the best thing for preserving life is to preach the gospel and to have just law. Now, you're thinking if you're a stay-at-home mom or if you're a dad who's working every day and you're saying, well, I don't think I'm uh, set apart to be a lawmaker, what can I do? Well, I want you to think in terms of uh, the ordo amoris that uh, Augustine talked to us about. The Order of Morris says there are ordered loves that give you proximity and priority that also have to deal with the urgency of an issue. So proximity would be you are to love your family or those who are closest to you, think in kind of concentric circles, Love your family first. So if, if you're a mom and you're hearing this and you're just becoming, uh, you think you might be becoming an abolitionist uh, on, on abortion, well, you can start uh, talking to your, your family about this and you can show them films like A Storm Comes Rolling Down the Plane and you can uh, buy 
some booklets from rescuethose.com, or you can look at abolitionists rising and watch their videos. They have a, a ton of great content. They are the standard bearer when it comes to uh, abortion abolition. You can uh, start talking to your friends then. Uh, dads, you can start teaching your children about what God's word says on uh, life. And he has made all people in his own image. And that means that they're all valuable and worthy from the moment of fertilization. You can teach them what God's word says. And then you can teach your friends. You can talk to them. You can talk to the people at your church. Now we're back. We're moving outward in concentric circles. Um, now, when we talk about the urgency of a matter, let me put it in terms like this. Is abortion a great evil of our age? Well, was the slaughter or the the, um, the murder and the gassing uh, and cremating of Jews a great evil during the uh, Third Reich and th during the Nazi Holocaust? Was that a great evil? Well, yes, it was. What should Christians in Germany have been doing during that time? Mm. Trains were driving by and the children were and, and the people were screaming in the trains because they knew what was happening. Uh, should the Christians just sing louder so they don't have to hear it? Whenever the uh, snow was falling in the summer and it was the ashes from the crematoriums falling on the people as they were walking about their day, should they just wipe the ash off and go and do their laundry? Yeah. They know that it, there's a great evil. They had happened. to do something. that <clears throat> They had to, at a minimum, speak up about it. Yes, we're asking a question about our culpability. Mm -hmm. What is the culpability of this nation whenever it faces the great evil? What is my culpability? What's my responsibility? So when you think of what would I have done back in the German Holocaust, would I have stood up and said anything? Would I have uh, hidden Jews? Would I have sought to smuggle them out? Well, what would you have done during uh, chattel slavery? What would you have done? Well, what you're doing now, if you're not standing up now, then you wouldn't have stood up then probably. For sure, what you're yeah. doing now is is a kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a statement on what you would have done in other great evils. So, well, and th I mean, those people were facing death if they spoke up, like somebody like Bonhoeffer, right? Uh, yep. When you speak up against those, uh, those leaders that they, they were being hunted down and killed. And uh, now Christians are facing, you know, you might, you might get censored on Facebook. You might get your Twitter account pulled down or you, you might lose some friends, right? Yeah. And, uh, and people aren't willing to speak up about it. Yeah, you're going to get some ridicule. You're, you might get uh, lambasted. I mean, you might have to change churches. Uh, people might church discipline you for taking this position. That's happened to people who are coming, uh, who, have, uh, who started the abortion abolition movement. Uh, it happens. Yeah. Uh, but to what end, you know, Jesus says, blessed are you when others mock and persecute you for my name. Mm -hmm. Great is your reward in heaven. Like when you're per persecuted for righteousness sake, right? For right. the sake of being standing up for what's right. That's right. Yeah. So how about Christians? What, what are, what can they do to join the abolitionist movement? Um, uh, we're talking about speaking up. Obviously, that's one thing. So how, how can they speak up and what else can they do to join the fight? Yeah, so they can speak up in various ways. You First, you need to educate yourself so that whenever you do speak up, you will be prepared. And that's just the, the same in any number of areas whenever you first learn about something. So begin to educate yourself. Go to rescuethose.com. Go to freethestates.com or abolitionists rising. Educate yourself. Learn. That's what I did for a long uh, while before I started speaking up on the, on in this new direction. Uh, educate yourself, and then uh, you can 
You can go and join uh, like Facebook groups like uh, Abolitionist Rising. You need to friend some of these folks who are on Twitter that are abolitionist. Uh, you need to get some material and then you can start sharing that with your family. You can start sharing that with folks in your church. You can uh, give some of us a call, reach out to us, and we're glad to to interact with you. Um, once you've you've educated yourself, then you can uh, probably go find an abortion mill or some folks who are who are holding signs up in the streets to agitate the culture to think about the great evil that's right in front of them and to know how to address it. And you can go and get to know your legislators and get them. Uh, tell them what God's word says, because they are to be servants of God. You can perhaps pray that God would uh, set apart, well, not just perhaps, pray that God would call more workers into the harvest of legislation, that there would be more senators and representatives who would uh, run bills of abolition. We've had bills of abolition run in about 14 states. We need more in every one of those states. It's the pro-life movement, not the pro-aborts. It's the pro-life movement mm -hmm. that are killing those bills of abolition. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do. Say, and say I would, that one more time. It's <clears throat> Actually, it's the pro-life organizations that are stopping abolitionist bills, abolitionist laws, laws that will actually stop abortion, make it illegal, and make it punishable uh, that that's the that's the pro life industry that's actually stopping that from happening. So they're not actually trying to stop abortion. Yeah, in about fourteen states, maybe more, there have been bills of abolition that have been run, and in every one of these states, it's not the pro abortion industry or the lobbyists that are killing the bills of abolition. They rarely even have to make any statements. It's the pro-life movement that is killing these bills in every state. You can look at the statistics. There is plenty of information in there, but they do not want to criminalize the act of abortion and treat it as though it's prenatal homicide. They kill the bills of abolition. Mm. You mentioned the abortion mill ministry, like actually going to the abortion mill first of all how can they find how can people find an abortion mill in their city how can they uh find the abortion mill that actually performs the murders the the slaughter how, how do you find those um yeah answer that okay there's a couple different ways you can go to the rescue those app we have an app you can download on uh, Apple or Google Play Store, and then you can go and it it will, there'll be a link on the app that says, get involved in my area. And it will take you to where there are abortion mills. And it's pretty simple. It's an, it's a search on Google Maps that tells you where there are abortion mills. That's one. Second, you can go to Abolitionist Rising and you can ask, you can reach out to them and say, where are there abolitionists? who are going to abortion mills in my state. Some states have closed abortion mills, uh, but that doesn't mean that abortion is banned. It's not. Women are still allowed to kill their children with, with immunity in all those states. They are a protected class of murderers. So there might be a state that doesn't have the mills open, but there would be other outreach that's happening. And you just need to reach out. Probably mm. abolitionist rising is the best place to go. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, just a, a warning. If uh, you know, th this is an extreme ministry, meaning you're going to if you go to one, you, you need to be prepared because of the nature of what we are fighting. It's it's a disgusting evil. And you're going to see and hear things that are disgusting. And, you know, w one of the things I remember going uh, for the first time, and I asked the fellow that was leading it, you know, they have uh, signs all over that are very graphic that show pictures of aborted babies. Uh, I remember one of the things he would do is he would take a little plastic doll and he ripped it apart so it was little body parts and he would just throw it on the, on the road 
uh, because at abortion mills, a lot of them, they have it where it's like a gated place so that you can't, uh, you can't have any face-to-face -face contact with these people because they can, they realize, you know, Planned Parenthood realizes that if they talk to a Christian and, uh, you know, that they're losing their business if, if the person decides not to abort their baby. So they, they put up everything they, they can to stop interaction uh, but so what he did, like I said, he put the, the doll parts on the street. And so the people are literally having to drive over these doll parts past these signs. And I asked the fellow, I said, you know, why <clears throat> I love the ministry, but, you know, I'm thinking I, I want to bring my kid here to do this. And I'm thinking, I, I don't really want my kid to see pictures like this. Why do we have to have pictures like this? And he said, you know, this is one of the most effective tools because they are not able to have that face-to-face -face contact. So when those moms are driving in or, you know, the boyfriend or dad or whoever is driving the girl in and they see these pictures and they see the thing on the, gr on the ground, um, it's just, you know, it's showing them reality because what, what they're trying to do is deceive themselves into thinking it's not a baby. It's just some cells or it, you know it's going to be okay it's not that big of a deal everybody you know our culture does it it's it's legal it's accepted they're trying to deceive themselves but when you see it you realize no this is real this is this is murder it, it tells you what it tells you what you're about to do so um i do want to give that warning and also you know, do you have any stories, <clears throat> excuse me, do you have any stories about the women? Because, you know, one of the things, one of the rhetoric from the other side is that these women are victims. Uh, and you kind of covered that before. You know, some of them are coerced and some of them are, have, do have pressure and things like that. But the fact that they're, they're or, you know, that they're saying it's, they're a victim, that's actually not true. And actually, we see things at the abortion mills that show that they are not only not victims, but they're willing and almost like enjoying it. It's like evil, evil, very evil. So do you have any stories of uh, encountering women at the abortion mill like that? Oh, man. Tons. It's, it's every time you go, it's going to be uh, women who are justifying what they're doing and they do it in various ways uh i've look i've killed my baby and I'll, I'll i've killed other babies i'll kill this one too uh and i don't care uh, i'll eat my baby you know i've heard women who uh are just say the most vile things and and they'll they'll take they'll talk about having sexual relations with christ uh playing music and th they'll be you know, death scorts is what we call them, escorts who mm. uh, bring these women into the clinic and they'll try to put uh, earplugs on them or headphones so that they don't have to listen so that their consciences don't get pinged by the things that we're saying. We're just uh, pleading with them to come to Christ and that we'll provide real help with them. And, and we want to preach the gospel to them and, you know, plead with them not to kill their, their own child. They're not going to not be a mom. They're just going to be a mom of a murdered child, but man, just the, the worst things. And then guys who are taking their girlfriends in or dropping them off. Most of the time, the guys just sit in the car and they'll crank the music up really loudly or whatever. But sometimes you can have great conversations with them. But at other times, you know, I've had guys threaten to kill me. Uh, guys brandish their gun at me. Uh, one guy had a gun and he said he was he was leaving and he was going to come back and, and shoot me up. And my family was there. Uh, we've had I have friends who uh, have had stuff thrown at them, uh, have been hit and struck by by them. Wow. Uh, there's just, yeah. you know, there's 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 tons of stories that I don't want to get into, uh, you know, how vile it's it, it can be. But, yeah, it it. it it's bad. And it's rare that you actually uh, have a woman who says, you know, I, I need help. I want, yeah. I, 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 I want to keep my baby. Now it happens for sure. Or I want to give it up for adoption. That's, that's rare too. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's rare, but it happens. And that's why we're there. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why we're there, but we don't know how many of those will hear, um, hear the gospel, hear the truths that we're saying, and they, they will leave and God will work on their heart. You know, it's, it's the gospel. It's the word of God that corrects the conscience that trains the conscience and uh shows that the conscience is is condemning a person they aren't we're not condemning them they would condemn themselves to their own actions but whenever their conscience is functioning it proves that it is or not uh so yeah it, it's 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 a heartbreaking ministry it's it's uh very somber uh but at the same time it's it's uh it's an act of love. It's, mm-hmm. it's a ministry of mercy towards these people. And, um, and that's what, why the church is here. Now the laws should be telling them that it's, it's murder, but the church should also be coming over and telling them, look, it is murder, but there can be forgiveness of, in Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's not a place for the laws to tell them that the laws uh, of the state and the gospel that's being preached by the church, they should function, uh, perfectly in harmony as God's law and gospel do. Mm. What about, what about peaceful civil disobedience? Uh, I had a friend recently, his daughter uh, was on trial and she, they did like a, a sit in at an abortion clinic. Uh, what, what do you think about those that, that as a, a ministry or, or, you know, a form of fighting this, Days evil. Look, man, I understand those things. Um, it, th- that rescue movement is a long-standing movement, and they are looking at the great evils of our culture and saying we've got to do something. Um, you know, typically, that is not going to have long-lasting effects uh, in shutting down any any abortion mills. Uh, it it does kind of raise awareness that there is a great evil that's happening. Uh, but that that abortion mill is going to pull those people out or it's going to uh, just move them away from their doors. They're going to be arrested and they're just going to keep going about their work unscathed. Uh, so really, we need to be pursuing legislation. We need to be pursuing the Christians uh, to see that this is, a, a great evil in our culture and churches must start standing up against this great evil. And we as Christians must start taking action and we need uh, men preaching the truth about this and activating got the church of Christ. And some of that activation is going to mills, going to the streets and preaching the gospel, telling your family and friends and, and your coworkers and, also becoming legislators who will write these laws. So, you know, I, I'm not going to speak disparagingly against uh, any of those who are convicted in their conscience that they need to pursue uh, the rescue uh, tactics. Mm. Very good. Now, I mean, there's no, <clears throat> I want to ask you about how many saves confirm save, because I know that one thing that will happen at the abortion mill is You'll you'll see somebody pull up, and they drive past. You know they drive past all the signs, and you're you're telling them not to kill their baby, and they park. They'll park for thirty minutes, and then they drive off. That could be a save, but but how many confirmed saves do, do you or your church do, do you know? Do you guys keep record of any of that? You know, uh, our, the abortion mills are closed in Oklahoma now, and when they were open, we would. Uh, we we would try to keep track of them, but sometimes those numbers are not they're not they're not you know exact. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you about an example of one. Uh, so instead of it, it was it was several. Uh, we had between the groups that are going to the mills in Tulsa and then the mills in Oklahoma City, and then there was one in Norman. We had several saves. Uh, and I say they're not exact because, you know, if they leave the parking lot, but then they come back the day that you're not there yeah. and you don't know about it, you can't really call it a save mm-hmm. uh, because they still killed their child. And maybe they just went to a different place. But 
I have a couple stories of confirmation where in Oklahoma, we have seen babies uh, rescued and uh, then we've thrown baby showers for them and provided for their physical needs, even put them up in an apartment. Uh, one time wow, I was uh, preaching the gospel at an abortion mill in Norman, Oklahoma, and where the where the modern abolition movement uh, was reignited back in 2011, 2012. Um, and a, a, uh, a crew came up to mow the lawn and they were mainly Spanish speaking. And they had just come to mow the lawn. There weren't a lot of women who were coming in. And so I was preaching the gospel and, and, and I asked the, the crew foreman, Hey, do you know what they do here? You're, you're making their lawn look good, but inside there, they're murdering children. Mm -hmm. You're trimming, uh, using these, these tools to trim up the lawn, but inside they're using tools to cut babies to pieces and suck them out with, uh, vacuums. And he said, oh, yeah, I, you know, I've heard, I think I know about that. And he, and I said, do you approve of it? And he said, no. He said, man, I need help. And it was, kind of caught me off guard. And he wow. said his girlfriend uh, was pregnant and he wanted to keep the baby, but she wanted to, to kill it. And he said, will you talk to her? So a buddy of mine who was Spanish speaking, he, he was, a um, he, he's a Spanish speaking guy. He got on the phone with the, that guy and his girlfriend and talked them through. And we found out a little while later that they had kept their child. And that was just from a guy who was coming to mow the lawn at an abortion. Wow, mill. Praise God. Divine appointment. He spoke to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, it's all providential. That's why we trust the providence of God. Amen. So that was actually my next question is what would you say to uh, a young lady or any lady for that matter who is considering abor an abortion currently? Okay. So whenever they're walking up to the mill or if you're interacting with them on the street, we, we do three things and there's three categories that can really help. First, we plead with them not to murder their child. And they have three Ps. So plead with them not to murder their child. Number two, preach the gospel to them. And number three, uh, provide real help. So we plead with them not to murder their child. We talk about it being a true life that God created in his own image. He gives value and worth that he opened and closed her womb and that he has rewarded her with a child. This is not a curse. It's a mm -hmm. blessing. So to receive it as such. Second, we preach the gospel. Look, though your sins are many, you can be forgiven. You can be white as snow. And Christ comes to not only forgive you, but give you a life of love and joy in him. And then third, we if they have a problem where they can't afford it, or this is... Uh, they have they need protection from from a pimp or someone like that then we want to find out what their real needs are because they're their whole people body and soul and we want to see what physical needs they might have and so those conversations will will be able to go where they need to go on those three areas play with them not to murder their child preach Christ and provide real help sounds like the gospel to me that's awesome mm -hmm. yeah and uh how about this? What would you say to a woman who has already had an abortion? Maybe somebody who's listening to this message and they're being convicted. Yeah. We have a, a couple women in our church who have had abortions. Uh, one woman first said, you know, if the laws would have told me that it was illegal and that it was the crime of murder to kill my child, then I wouldn't have done it. So she wished the laws would have taught her and told her and and warned her and then avenged her child that's what she wished but to that to those women we say though you have killed another person so that you can have the life that you want jesus offered himself as a sacrifice in your place so that you could have the life that you do not deserve your sin of killing your own child was nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. And if, if you have believed on Christ, 
then God punished Christ in your place. He punished Christ for the not only the, the deeds that you did and the words that you said, but also the way that you hated your neighbor, that preborn child, your own child in your heart, and the way that you thought about your preborn neighbor, that it was not a person, that it was not worth protecting, that it was just uh, to be use, used at your own expense, that it was a an object for you to crush and kill however you wanted. That Christ took the punishment for all those things that you did, and he offers you forgiveness of sin by his grace and by his grace alone, so that you can be, though wicked and sinner, you can be forgiven and made right with God through Christ and, and through faith in him, and that you can have a full life now in joy and not no longer condemned for your sin. And you will also, you're off, offered the love of this Christian community who Christ has brought you into. You've been a, now a, a, a daughter of Christ, and you're a family member to us, and we will love you and support you uh, without giving you judgment or condemnation. We will only give you the grace of God, and you're a vessel of mercy to receive his, his mercy now, both now and forevermore. Amen. As the church, we are to look at people as they are. If they're in Christ, they're a new creation. That's what the Bible says. And uh, we give people that have done horrible things, we can give them grace uh, because of Christ, because he's forgiven us. So we don't, uh, there should be no judgment, no um, uh, moral judgment over someone in, in a, con a condemning way uh, or looking down at someone who has repented of that sin and put their faith in Christ because God has forgiven them. And uh, so, Dusty, I want to I wanna thank you so much for coming on the show again. Uh, how can people find you? Well, you can find me on Twitter at Dusty Devers. You can uh, find me through rescuethose.com. You'll see some articles or booklets that I've written there. I've also written... Uh, some articles on the internet, but I also am a pastor. One of the pastors, there's three of us at Grace Community, Grace Reformed Baptist Church of Elgin, Oklahoma. You can look me up there. Uh, you can also uh, watch the video or the uh, documentary, A Storm Comes Rolling Down the Plain. It should be helpful. Awesome, brother. Thanks again. And, uh, you know, I want to give a big shout out to the Mighty Oaks Foundation uh, my buddy Chad Robichaux, he has made this episode possible, and I want to give him a, a, a big shout out. They have a, a ministry that helps men and women that suffer from PTSD, uh, you know, military personnel. So if you're suffering from PTSD, please call them, look them up on the internet. They give free camps for people. It's a Christian foundation, and uh, they have a very, very high success rate. And uh, you guys can check me out on Twitter. I'm at, at Nathan Marquart, uh, Instagram at Nate Marquart. And uh, that's it for today, guys. I uh, want to thank you guys for tuning in. And until next time, let's keep fighting for truth. God bless y'all.